Hello, E Vegas, and every, hi everybody uh, who's on the on the live stream. Um, who's ready for some science? Yeah. And it's the first of a double whammy. So straight after me, we got Max Singularity talking about NASA going to the moon. But for me, I'm Ian O'Neill, and I am in. By day, I'm a science communicator, and I have a background in solar astrophysics. So well done, CCP, on the upgrades to all the suns, because I keep flying to them, and I hang out of the sun. So if you ever see my character, Ansela N. Thilles, with Rapid Withdrawal in system, check the sun, because I'll be there, looking at the beautiful graphics that you've uh, produced. So I wanted to come to this eVegas to um, talk about three things. Uh, one, my background with eVe, and second, the most awe-inspiring event that really happened this year in the field of science, and it's one of the, my top three um, science achievements by mankind since I started becoming a science reporter and a science communicator. And then I wanted to talk about um, my day job, which is with the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, based out of San Francisco. We're a nonprofit educational foundation, and um, I want to talk about a little bit what they do and kind of connected to this presentation. Okay, uh, that's me. Okay, so if we rewind the clock back to 2013, I didn't know anything about EVE Vegas. I had no idea about EVE Online. I had no idea about this wonderful uh, community of players that I know, know and love and my wonderful court mates uh, down here supporting me. Um, and I've got some really great friends and stories from the whole experience of playing EVE. But back in 2013, um, I heard a big event that had happened in space. And at the time, I was working for Discovery News. And Discovery News is part of Discovery Channel. And I was the space producer. And I was trying to find some connection between what I do, like communicating science, and gaming. And of course, you know, I was talking about connection between science fiction and science. And this just seemed like a kind of a cool crossover. But I heard about this huge battle that happened in this place called BTAC R5RB. And I contacted my boss. And she's a very cool boss, because I said, there's this really cool um, space event that's happened. I've wrote, written an article about it. The article is very popular. And um, CCB Games actually reached out to me because they read the article. And they said, hey, Ian, do you know we've got an event in Vegas each year? Do you want to come? So I got on the phone to my boss. And she said, yeah, you can go to Vegas. We'll pay for everything. And I was like, oh, yes. I love that job. It was so good. So I ended up coming here as a science reporter. And it was a hell of a lot of fun. Uh, it was actually held in the Rio that year. And I think it was only about what, 300 people there. So it was kind of a smaller community. Um, but we had a lot of fun. It was great to speak to the devs. I got to interview um, a few of the guys about how what EVE is and just how, um, how cool it is. And I spoke to some of the gamers as well. And I realized that this community is actually very unique in a lot of ways. And I was interviewing um, a lot of gamers. And one guy said, it's not a game, Ian. This isn't a game. This is a lifestyle. He was obviously from Goon Swarm. So I, I went, OK, uh, you know, that, that sounds interesting, but um, I might give it a go. Who knows? And I kind of shuffled off. Um, but then seven Eve Vegas is later. I'm here, and I'm playing the game. And um, it's kind of sad that I haven't been able to log in quite as much because of work commitments and whatever. But um, this is me, this good-looking chap. I'm Ansley in Thillies. I am a PVP player. I'm a pirate. I fly with Rapid Withdrawal. Pen is out. Uh, a very dubious alliance name, Pen is Out Alliance. And we are recruiting, so come and join us. And just what was said in um, yesterday's keynote about this community, when I joined Rapid Withdrawal, I was a terrible pilot at first, but I was welcomed in. And this group of guys you know, build you up. They give you confidence. And when you find that cooperation, you, you actually build, build real world friendships. I don't have to tell you all this. Um, but you just, you just know when you find that group of people. And now I've got real world friends because of it. It's a kind of a nice, nice crossover. So yeah, real world friendships and a new appreciation for gaming. Because to be honest, until EU Vegas came, sorry, until Eve Online came along into my life, the nearest space game I'd played was like Frontier Elite back in the 90s. So I hadn't really picked up a game for a long time. And this online gaming thing, internet spaceships, it kind of played into my career. And I was like, OK, I can actually these two kind of play off each other really well. And also, 
there is a lot of science in EVE. And I've seen so many talks about you know, warp drives, you know, into the spaceships, um, wormholes with really cool um, graphics as well that are kind of scientifically accurate as well. And just the economy of EVE is very lifelike. Uh, interstellar travel, I actually made a few friends who have, um, who have spoken at these events during the Making EVE Re Real uh, presentations, especially at FanFest. And I've been doing this for a few years now where I've been playing the game and also I've been a science communicator, I've been writing for all these outlets and I've realized that it's been an inspiration for me and that's why I kind of want to bring some science to you this time so I'm giving a little bit of payback. So, I don't have to tell you this, black holes are awesome. And if you've been paying attention this year, there's been some really big news about black holes. So just very quickly, I'm not gonna bore you with all the science of how black holes are made, but they come in all kinds of sizes. Um, we think they start microscopic, so they're kind of like sub-atomic sub size. Um, they can be produced, well, theory suggests they could be produced in things like the Large Hadron Collider. Um, very high energy collisions could actually form little rips in space time. If they disappear, they, don't, they won't kill you, it's totally fine. And they, you know, you've got like the stellar mass black holes, which are basically uh, when stars bigger than our sun go supernova, they collapse in on themselves and produce a singularity that basically warps space time so much that space time collapses in on itself and it produces an event horizon where nothing can escape, not even light. So we'll go on, we'll go on to that in a bit. And then you go all the way up to like the intermediate mass black holes, which we don't know an awful lot about, but we're not talking about them. We're gonna talk about supermassive black holes. And these things are the true titans of the universe. They are the biggest, most massive things that we know of. So what I kind of like about event horizons is basically where the known universe ends. Anything approaching it or falling into the event horizon cannot come out. There's some ideas that information that falls in may come out, but that's kind of well beyond this talk. Um, and it's definitely worth reading about. Um, Stephen Hawking was heavily involved in all that. Um, it's basically we have no experience about what can happen beyond the event horizon. And that is kind of, that's a brain teaser. So these things are very enigmatic. These things are incredibly cool to study and read about. And also, they are very simple objects. Black holes, they are governed by general relativity, which is a theory that was developed over 100 years ago by a guy named Einstein. And a funny little fact, about that, he, although he created the framework for general relativity, basically explaining how un the universe works, how space-time works, how gravity works, he didn't actually believe that black holes could exist in reality. Even up to his death, he, he swore blind that they're, they're, they're not, never gonna exist, they're just too extreme, even though his, his, um, his equations could cater for it, and actually that was all proven to be incorrect. So he was both very wrong and very right, so interesting character. So until this year, we've never directly seen a black hole. And when I say seen the black hole, you can't actually see the black hole because the black hole in itself is a singularity. So that's hidden behind an event horizon, which is all intents and purposes just black because everything that falls in, can't get out. So, but that doesn't mean that we didn't have an idea as to what a black hole might look like. So you've, you're very familiar with science fiction movies. Um, we we kind of have an idea that there's gonna be a black area in the middle, there's gonna be an accretion disk like spiraling around the outside, and this accretion disk is just matter falling in, it's getting dragged in by the awesome gravity of these, of these supermassive black holes in the center of galaxies. And we got kind of a good idea, even up in the, in the top corner, um, top right corner, the, very early on, early simulations, we had an idea as to what these things would look like if you just use general relativity. And that's kind of important for a thing for what I'll discuss later. But there's a lot of unknown things with black holes. We know they produce, some of them produce very, very powerful jets. And as you can see with the next image around, there's a powerful jet that's actually um, gases flying out of this black hole at, at the speed of light or near the speed of light. And of course we know Black holes eat things, and there's a graphic of a poor star getting shredded. And there's um, another subset of black holes which are kind of cool. They are, they've been around since the beginning of time, since the, since the Big Bang. They're very hypothetical. Again, we haven't found any evidence for them yet, um, but there's that little guy kind of floating down in the corner. Um, they just, just kind of bump around the universe, and we don't really see much of them. And there's also really compelling evidence that these black holes do exist, because up until recently, um, and seeing is believing, we've only got indirect evidence of these supermassive entities in the centers of most galaxies that we know of. And one of the most crazy things, I, I just love this little movie of, um, these are the, 
this, this is an observation of stars around the, the, around the center of our galaxy, and they seem to be orbiting something. There's something extremely compact in the center of our galaxy, and it's causing this huge gravitational um, effect on the stars in the center. And what could explain that? Well, a black hole. But there could be other explanations. It could be another very compact object which perhaps isn't a black hole. Because we can't see it, we have no idea really what it is. We have a good idea, but we, don't, we, we can't actually prove it until we see it. So supermassive black holes, as I say, they're the titans of all supermassive black holes. And we know that they exist in pretty much all the galaxies that we look at, certainly decent-sized galaxies. They sit in the center. They range in mass from millions to billions of solar masses. So think of billions of suns being compressed into a singularity, popping through space-time. You can imagine these things are heavy. I mean, heavy is not the right term, but very massive. So there's a few questions surrounding um, supermassive black holes in the center of galaxies. First of all, what came first? Was it the chicken or the egg? Did supermassive black holes form an anchor for these galaxies to form around them? Or did the galaxies kind of form by themselves and the matter create the supermassive black hole in the center? That's one of the key questions at the moment in, in modern, um, modern cosmology. Um, also, they make or break entire galaxies. And we could say that we are all here because our supermassive black hole is a particularly well-tuned black hole. It didn't blow away too, many, too much of the gas that went on to form our sun, which then went on to form our planet and ultimately us. Um, and it wasn't too inactive that it didn't compress um, the, 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 uh, all the matter and all the gas to create our star in the first place. So these questions are active areas of research right now in cosmology and astrophysics. Now, on a theor deeply theoretical level, if we can actually see um, a, an event horizon of a supermassive black hole, we get to have an extreme test of Einstein's general relativity. Does his theory break down at the most extreme corners of the universe? We don't really, still we don't really know that answer for sure, although this year we've certainly advanced our knowledge a little bit in that direction. And also another really cool thing I actually wrote about recently, um, there's hopes that, I mean, we can actually observe black holes, um, certainly the region around a black hole in many different wavelengths. So we've known for a long time that there's these flaring events. And these flaring events are highly energetic. And what they think that happens when a star or some other matter gets really too close, it basically gets ripped to shreds and gets blended and turns mass into energy. And you get this, this, this huge flaring event. And what you can do, you can actually watch this flare cool as it's whipping around the, uh, the accretion disk of the black hole before it gets sucked into the black hole. And what that, that can actually be a probe for astrophysicists to actually see the fabric of space-time at the closest edge to the event horizon of a black hole. And so if our understanding of physics isn't quite as complete as we think it is, we might be able to see some little alterations in general relativity. Perhaps there's some quirks that we haven't quite worked out. Perhaps there's this interplay between quantum dynamics, which is the physics of the very small, uh, interplaying with general relativity, which is the physics of the very big. And as I say, this year has been incredibly exciting for this one thing. So the Event Horizon Telescope. The Event Horizon Telescope is the effort, is a global effort to actually produce the first direct image of a supermassive black hole's event horizon. Now, I want to just point out, I am not at all affiliated with the HT, so any mistakes are totally mine, and any bad jokes are, again, not, not the HTs. So I just worked with them actually very closely in the run-up to um, April 10th, which was the big announcement of the first direct image of a black hole. And I worked with the University of Waterloo um, and their theorist, um, Avery Broderick. And he's been working on the, the, the science behind the HT for over 20 years. So this has been a very big endeavor. It's involved hundreds upon hundreds of people from all over the globe, a massive collaboration. It's an all-inspiring project. OK, so within the range of the EHT, um, even though these things are extremely big, extremely massive, they are very, very difficult to see. Because the nearest supermassive black hole to us is ours. It's the, um, the, the Sagittarius A star, which is in the center of our galaxy. And there's another comparable um, black hole, which is actually millions of light years away, which I will come to now. 
So as you can see, we got the Milky Way on the left, and it's our supermassive black hole, Sagittarius A-star, is around about 25,000 uh, light years away. And it weighs in at around about 4 million solar masses, so it's certainly not a slouch when it comes to mass. It's, it's, a, it's a big black hole, but as far as supermassive black holes go, it's tiny, because the other supermassive black hole that the EHT is actually studying is um, in the uh, massive elliptical galaxy M87, and it's roughly in the core of the galaxy, and that comes in at a whopping 6.5 billion solar masses, which is pretty much one of the largest, in fact, it's certainly up there in the top 10 of largest supermassive black holes that we know of, and I think they're actually termed ultramassive black holes, because there's no words that really describe just how gargantuan these things are. And it just so happens this supermassive black hole is 60 million light years away. So it's approximately 2,000 times further away, but it's also 2,000 times more massive. So that's kind of intriguing, because if you look at them in, in the sky, they've got the similar kind of angular size in the sky. So it's within reach of the EHT. So really, the EHT can only look at the most massive of supermassive, the most massive of black holes. So you forget about the stellar mass black holes and anything around that size. They're just simply too tiny for our capabilities right now. OK, so I had to put an EVE reference in. So using the, the finest spaceship in EVE history, the Atron, traveling at a speed of 5 AU per second, if it left Earth and went to the supermassive black hole in the center of uh, the Milky Way, it would take 10 years. So that's quite a long time. So you know, if you started a warp back in 2009, you would have just got there. Um, but that pales into insignificance as to how far away M87's black hole is. So if you took, oh, wrong way. So if you took the same Atron and flew to that supermassive black hole, just to give you a sense of scale about how far away this other black hole is from, from Earth, it would take you 24,000 years, going warp nonstop. No toilet breaks. You just go in, in your little Atron to M87. And as I say, it's one of the biggest black holes we've got. And you can actually see, um, you can actually see them there that around about the same size in the sky if we looked up. If we could see them in our eyes, we can't. But. So the challenge of actually seeing a supermassive black hole is pretty huge. And it's a bit like, I mean, I love these analogies that uh, the scientists just kind of come out with. It's like, oh, yeah, it's like seeing the date on the penny from New York to, to Los Angeles. And literally, it is that hard. It's basically like trying to take a photograph of a grapefruit on the surface of the moon. And if you know from the, the grainy images we see of the moon from, from astronomers, we don't even come close to seeing that. So, we have to have a telescope which has an aperture as wide as our planet to see these objects. So it's obviously inconvenient to have a dish which is that size. We just can't build it. But fortunately, we have a planet. So we can do something with that, surely. So, and as I said, I already mentioned there's another coincidence in that uh, M87 is 2,000 times bigger, but also 2,000 times further away. So we've got two very comparable objects that the EHT is going after right now. And so, to actually create a planet-sized telescope, you need to use a method known as very long baseline interferometry. Again, that's way beyond the scope of this talk, but certainly read about it. I don't fully understand how it works. But basically, you just take a whole bunch of uh, radio observatories around the world. They record data at the same time of the same object. And it just so happened back in April uh, 2017, in eight of the locations around the world, from the South Pole to the Atacama Desert in Chile to Hawaii, um, they were able to have um, good weather conditions to um, actually see the black hole of M87. And as I said before, it took a huge team. And I think I really understate this. I mean, it's hundreds of, hundreds of scientists, but you have to think all the support staff, you have to think all the engineers and the, and the technicians who actually work together around the globe from many different nations. I forget how many nations. There's at least a dozen different nations involved in this, and many institutions around the world, all the theorists that actually came together on this like 25-year odyssey to actually make this a thing. So that's why I would rank, I mean, after, after the discovery of the Higgs boson, um, the discovery of gravitational waves, another um, win for Einstein, um, I would say this is my top three um, uh, science things I've actually written about in my career as a science communicator. Um, and the observational data, it was kind of crazy. I mean, I don't, I'm not a programmer. I'm not a uh, computer guy as such. But I know that five petabytes of data to produce one image seems pretty heavy. 
And I think that equates to like half a ton of hard drives. And so you can't really send that data over the internet because it would take too long, especially from the South Pole, which is very difficult to get to, let alone you know, uh, internet connection. So you actually have to fly these hard disks to locations in Germany and the US where um, these scientists, they, they put together the data and try and interpret um, what this thing looks like. But of course, we're looking in radio waves. We're not looking in a, like visual light. So, and when you see these objects in deep space, it's very hard to understand what they look like, what kind of shape they should be. So there's a fascinating story behind the whole data analyst um, effort that went into this. And I, I really hope you, you um, find, you read about it, because it's, uh, it's a kind of an intriguing story. And as I said, the, all the data was taken on April 2017. It took 2018 to actually um, analyze the stuff and actually produce the image. And the first image came out on April 10th, 2019, which was this year. And this is it. This is the black hole's event. This is a black hole event horizon inside the galaxy M87. So that's the galaxy which is 60, 60 million light years away. So you'd think the first image we get would be our supermassive black hole, because it's only 25,000 light years away. But because in our galaxy we're inside the disk of the galaxy, there's a lot of dust and gas between us and the center of our galaxy. It actually makes it very difficult for the EHT to resolve that image. But there is going to be an image coming from, uh, of, of, of Sagittarius A star, so I'm really excited to see our black hole. But because there's a lot of empty space between us and the galaxy M87, the EHT has, a better, has an easier job of actually producing this image. And I just want to, I won't dwell too much on the details of what we're seeing, but I'll try and pull um, some, of the, some of the features, which are pretty cool. So, this um, donut hole in the middle, that is the uh, shadow of an event horizon. So we have all intents and purposes with seeing a black hole because that's the, the only visible thing for, because it's got a lack of light. And it's basically, and all this light surrounding the black hole is actually coming from behind it. So it's like a projection effect. It's almost like a silhouette we're seeing. And it's beaming in our direction and that hole in the middle is basically the event horizon, the point of no return. Light cannot get out of it, so that's why it's black. And after a little bit of analysis, um, scientists then understood a little bit about which way it's oriented. So it's kind of, kind of like facing down towards the bottom right of the um, bottom right of the screen, kind of facing towards us as well. So we're kind of looking at like a polar view, looking down. And there's a little bit of motion in the accretion disk, which surrounds the black hole. And that's what the relativistic beaming is. So this bright crescent on one side is basically material that's being accelerated towards us at relativistic speeds. And um, there's a physics effect behind that called relativistic beaming, where there's this preferential forward motion of energy creating this bright crescent. So there's, it's, it's a hothouse. It's like a, a petri dish of physics that we're seeing here. The, incredible gravity that, which is causing this is just, it's, it's mind-boggling when you actually see the numbers. I mean, we're talking about a 6.5 billion solar mass black hole here. So this thing is, it's, it's incredible. And uh, oh, we have a photon sphere, so I'm just kind of pointing out that um, the, the weirdest thing that I kind of wrap my head around is that there's like an inner orbit of, um, of uh, photons, so basically little pop packets of light that are traveling at light speed, they actually get stuck in orbit around the, the black hole. If, they don't, if they're unlucky, they fall in. Sometimes they'll, they'll just speed out. But the last, the last point of um, orbit around the black hole is the, is the photon sphere. For scale, the solar system, pretty small. Fits very neatly inside that, uh, inside that um, shadow of the black hole. And to compare it with Thera, still Thera, the system where you can make a cup of tea, have some toast, do your taxes, after warping from one end to the other, um, it still fits well within this, this um, black hole's event horizon. And just, um, just for scale, uh, it's like, I think it's travel time across the event horizon is like uh, half a light day or something. So this thing is a substantial monster that's sitting in the middle of, of M87. Oh yeah, no, and the top, in the fact, the top left-hand corner is probably the best uh, graphic that I've actually found of somebody actually trying to give a three-dimensional perspective as to which direction the, the black hole's facing and where the accretion flow is. And also, because of this accretion flow, that we know which direction the matter is, is swirling in, we can actually get an idea as to um, whether the black hole's spinning or not. And it is spinning, which actually fits, again, with all our theories of general relativity. These are general relativity monsters. There's, at the moment, there's nothing else 
interfering with this picture of a black hole. This is exactly what a supermassive black hole should look like. And also, um, we've got a lot of information about this black hole already, because the Hubble Space Telescope and other space observatories have been looking at this thing. And it's actually got an active um, galactic core. So it's, it's got an active galactic nuclei. Active galactic nuclei. Active galactic AGN, yeah. <laughs> um, so it's got an AGN, so it's a very, very active black hole. And it's sucking in matter and blasting matter out at the speed of light from its poles creating this jet. And this jet actually goes over like several thousand light years. So it isn't a small thing by any means. But we want to know how this works. I mean, how, what, what kind of physics is behind this? I mean, it's, it doesn't make sense. And because now we've got this close-up look of a black hole, we can start to answer some of the most fundamental questions about black hole physics. I, I'm just saying. There was that, that, I, I, when I saw the Triglavian ships, I was like, oh, come on. It had to be. And so this is, uh, again, it's kind of looks like a disintegrator powering up. But uh, it's not. This is a, uh, a really cool graphic of the, um, how the black hole shadow is formed. So what is interesting, there's this projection effect. So the majority of the light forming this image of the black hole actually comes, comes from behind the black hole itself. So it's almost like a spotlight behind the black hole, and we can see the outline. But because space-time is so warped surrounding the black hole, it actually creates this um, expansion effect of the light. So the actual shadow is some 2.6 times bigger than the actual event horizon itself as we see it. So I thought that was kind of a cool thing. Now, just to really emphasize how spot on um, theoretical physicists were with this. So ju using just general relativity models, um, as this is like a general relativity magneto hydrod hydrodynamic model or whatever, using very powerful supercomputers, they were able to analyze what the supermassive black hole should look like. And on the left, you can see on the top pane, they, these are all the um, model results that are actually spat at the, uh, the, um, the computer. And on the lower level, it's basically what the, um, the EHT should see. After a bit of blurring, because of course you know we don't have too many um, radio telescopes in the network right now. There's only eight, but there's hopefully going to be more. So this image is going to become sharper and sharper over time. But this is what they expected it to see, and on the right is actually what they did see. And when I was speaking to Avery Broderick, one of the theorists, um, the guy up in um, in University of Waterloo, who actually came up with a lot of the theory behind what the HT should see, um, he said he thought somebody was joking with him because often what um, um, astronomers will do, they will inject an image into the data processing um, methods they put in, and they will do like a modeled image, and just to see if um, the, the obser observers know that whether that's the real thing or not. And actually, he looked at it, and he thought he was being fooled. He thought it was going to be a trial run just using modeled data, but it turned out that was the real data. So you've got this donut shape with the event horizon, black, uh, with the event horizon surrounding um, this, this inner core, and it's just a phenomenal achievement. Um, so recently, NASA put out this uh, really cool little GIF of, a, of what a supermassive black hole should look like from the side. Remember, our black hole, we're kind of seeing it from the top, so we don't see um, a lot of the accretion disk flowing around the front. But it's got the same features as what we've seen in the, in the, um, uh, in the event horizon first image of M87. You've got the accretion flow, which is flowing around. And Basically, the, um, the disk, it should look like Saturn if, um, if space-time wasn't so warped. So what you're seeing is the light from the accretion disk from behind the black hole is being wrapped over and below. So that's why we're getting this wonderful um, shadow in the center of this donut shape. And you may have seen something similar to this in a certain science fiction movie recently. And it doesn't only underscore um, the triumph of the EHT project, but also the triumph of, uh, of the Interstellar movie, because they had the sense to bring in uh, a, a physicist who actually created the most scientifically accurate black hole in movie history. And when that came out a few years ago, I thought, that's BS. There's no, there's no way this is going to be anything like what the EHT is going to see. But actually, they were very, very close on. As you can see, you've got accretion flow. You've got the center um, shadow of the, of the black hole. And actually, they kind of did some really cool stuff. You can actually see little clouds of, of um, relativistic matter around the outside. So um, yes, we're seeing that movie again, if only just for that image. Um, but don't get follow Matthew McConaughey into it, because I don't think it would have ended that well uh, in real life. But hey, you A-list actors. Um, so, because I was so dumbstruck by this image, obviously it carries a lot of weight with it because 
it proves that humanity can work together. I mean, this is many people all around the world, all different backgrounds, all coming together on a common goal to produce this first image to further our understanding of science. And when I was interviewing Avery Broderick um, before the image came out, he just left this wonderful quote. He said, I would hope that an image like this will galvanize a sense of exploration, an exploration of the mind and that of the universe. Basically, it's generating a sense of awe. And this is kind of leads into the third part of my talk quickly. Um, that's what we do. So at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, the ASP, as I said, we're a nonprofit educational-based um, society, and we work to um, spread science far and wide. I think I refer to uh, the ASP as uh, we're trying to use astronomy as a gateway to, to more STEM topics, almost like uh, Eve. Eve Online is a, is a gateway to Midnight Pizza or something like that. You're, you're trying to, we're trying to use astronomy as a tool to excite kids, adults, in, um, in formal and informal educational settings. And I've been working with them now for like two and a bit years. And I'm the editor of their Mercury magazine. And, um, and I, I just love what they do. I mean, I, they're a wonderful bunch of people. And uh, they work very closely with a lot of organizations you'll probably recognize in a sec. So our mission is basically just to give resources to educators and learners to make sure we can um, spread science far and wide. I mean, it's a very pure mission, to be honest. Um, so our partners, we work very closely with NASA, especially JPL. Um, and we work at the SETI Institute, looking for aliens and doing cool science with planets and stuff. Um, the NRAEO, which is the um, radio astronomy um, organization, the NSF, National Science Foundation, and some un more unlikely ones, like the Girl Scouts we work with. We work with um, a lot of um, kids' organizations because ultimately that we want to bring science into their lives, no matter what their backgrounds. Um, our current projects include um, uh, the, the new astronomy badges, actually, for the Girl Scouts. So um, a whole bunch of educational scientists from around the country put together a whole bunch of new badges for the Girl Scouts. And that's literally just gone out um, this last couple of months, actually. So uh, the ASP was responsible for designing the astronomy badge badges. So we got like Girl Scouts looking through telescopes, which is cool. Um, and also, uh, another big one of ours is actually the Night Sky um, Network, which is um, uh, the accumulation of all the amateur astronomy groups um, around the country. Um, we also have a project, a little book called Breakfast Moon, which has recently been published, and it's to inspire little kids to look at the phases of the moon. Um, and we do lots of really fun projects like that. We work with kids and adults alike. It's, it's really cool. And also, we've been around for the important uh, thing. We've actually been around for 130 years. So we've been doing this for a long time. So we know how to spread the word of astronomy, science, and STEM topics. Um, we also have some publications. Um, we actually have an academic journal, with, which is the publications of the ASP, and that's been going for, I think, as long as the society has been going itself. Um, it's very famous. It's peer-reviewed. And also, we have Mercury and Astrobeat, and they're called kind of more outreach um, publications. Uh, my magazine goes out every quarter, and it's available to uh, members. But we actually have a non-member facing website now called Mercury Online. And I'm hoping to bring more of the content of the magazine to the public as well. But every quarter, without fail, members always get the, uh, the, the Mercury and Astrobeat publications. Um, and really, our, our mission just, sums, it just comes to, you know, we just want to create a, an inclusive and diverse learning environment while providing the researchers for young and mature learners alike. And this goes from like local classrooms uh, to like excursions to Tibetan monks. I mean, it's, it's, we, we don't, we're not defined by our border. We, we're based on the Pacific coast. I mean, we're based in San Francisco, where a lot of our work gets done. But our reach is broad. I mean, we had a team go up to see the aurora on, in Iceland and, and you know, things like that. So it's, we, we do a lot of work. Um, as I say, we're very active in all these things. And I want you to join us. If, you, uh, if you're watching from the stream at home or here, you can use this discount code to join us. Our annual, um, annual rate is usually $55, so you get 25% off if you use that, uh, that code with before, I think it is, October 31st. And you will get all those wonderful things, but really, I want you to just get my magazine. So join us, get my magazine for free. Thank you so much. And as I went through this a little bit quicker than I planned, um, any questions? 
And if you can use the microphone in the middle, if you had any black hole questions, education questions, science communication questions, if you want to take a career in writing, I have some tips. I've got a quick question for you. Uh, what is the most commonly, I guess you could say, popular topic that most of the kids actually find a, you know, just interesting in general? Um, I'd say, especially with my work with ASP, we put a lot of emphasis on lunar studies. So like, uh, you can just go outside and study the phases of the moon. And kids just love it. Um, also, eclipses and transits. So like, the Venus transit was extremely popular for kids, because you can go outside, they got the, you know, you put the, the glasses on, you can actually see Venus. Um, of course, we got coming up in November the transit of Mercury. So there's, we got a lot of uh, work go going on with kids just so they can actually look through a telescope and actually see Mercury go across the surface, across the face of the sun. Um, but I'd say it's, it's things you can go outside and show them. If there's a, a meteor shower or something, take them outside and just see the see what's unfolding because kids love to love to learn through their experiences. And going outside in a cold night looking at the stars, you can't get better. And that's, that's basically what we try and do at the ASP. We just try and connect people with space. And the best you can seeing is believing. So you go outside and see it for yourself. That's really, the, that's really the key. So go outside with the telescope. Thank you. Are there uh, any other applications to the telescope after black holes? Or are there any other black holes you guys are going to look at? Sorry, so can you repeat the star again? Are there any other applications with the telescope, uh, or is it specifically just for black holes? Yes, yeah, so um, it's, the Event Horizon Telescope is primed just to look at these very compact objects which have um, very, very hot material surrounding them. And I think the wavelength they look in is like 1.3 millimeters, if, if that's of <laughs> value to anybody. But there, it's radio wavelengths, and that is the specific um, emissions that actually come from surrounding the black hole. I dare say it can be used for other things because um, uh, interferometry is used around the world on, on smaller levels. So you've got like uh, the, uh, you've got ALMA in the Atacama Desert, which is actually its own, um, its, its own uh, the, the interferometer. It's got like 66 dishes and they all work as one. So they're on top of this plateau and rather than building one single dish, you put 66 together. And so that's, um, that instrument looks at every, any high energy um, event in space and can study ga entire galaxies. It can study the center of our black hole to see in the, you know, the, the clouds surrounding it. Um, but yeah, the AHT itself, uh, its only purpose is to look at this ring of, uh, of black holes in distant galaxies. And as I say, there's two that's available to us. And they're two very different galaxies. Sorry, two very different black holes, which is really exciting. Thank you. OK, so I think now uh, I was Max Singularity's stage warmer. So he will be up after me. So be sure to be back at, what, 3 o'clock? 3 o'clock. Thanks so much. <laughs>